to Media Blender, your source for news, views, and information you can use here in Windsor, Essex. I'm your host, Veronica Drakowski. Minimum wage workers in Ontario are receiving an increase. The Liberal government decided last week to raise the minimum wage to $11 an hour, effective June 1st. While some workers are happy with the percentage, activists are asking for more. Lubna Fawaz spoke with Paul Chislett, the president of Windsor Workers Action Centre. Chislett begins by giving his reaction to the raise. The raise, and also that it's tied to the uh, rate of inflation. So that, that's, those are good things. Uh, unfortunately, at $11 an hour, it still isn't going to help people uh, get above the poverty line. So, um, you know, our organization was one of many that was calling for a $14 an hour hike in the minimum wage. Uh, and that, that figure would, you know, with enough hours would help people uh, live above the poverty line. So it looks like the campaign will have to continue to try to raise the basic wage uh, even, even though it's tied to the cost of inflation, um, people are still going to be struggling to make ends meet. You know, businesses always, they, they always cry poor, and there is a lot of sympathy for work, for businesses that are, you know, small organizations, only a few employees and a, a small margin of profit. Um, so a lot of people point to the big corporations, the big food corporations especially, like the McDonald's and the Walmarts and those places that make billions in profits every year and, and pay their workers so little. I mean, we have to, and I've, I've said this in other interviews too, we, we have to kind of break out the discussion. Uh, certainly there's, it's tough to, it's tough for business these days, uh, it always has been, but it's also tough for workers and, and we need to have a discussion about what kind of society we want in the long run because workers, even though they work uh, for a wage and even though they might even work quite a few hours at different jobs, they're, they're still filling in with food banks and, you know, other forms of income assistance. Mm -hmm. so at the Workers' Action Centre, that's what we've been attempting to do is to get workers to come together and, and discuss about mm -hmm. what's going on in their workplaces and what they see and what they think should change and, and building up that sense of social capacity that we really can, working together, make a difference. Maybe not right away, maybe not even next year, but at least have the conversation about what's going on in workplaces and having workers come together to decide what the, you know, what be, what's the best course of action. I don't know if workers want to lobby any further. Th there was a huge lobby effort to get the government to raise the, the, w the rate to $14 an hour, but maybe we should start taking the struggle directly to corporations especially, that uh, they should do the right thing. That was Lubna Fawaz speaking with Paul, Paul Chislett. Windsor tech firms use metadata to boost their customers' online presence and performance. This helps people search for what they want on the web. Director of Marketing at AlphaCore, Brandy Valencourt, says when talking about websites, the data is referred to as meta tags. It's an infrastructure on how to build your website, uh, from the content side of your website, to make sure that your website appears well in uh, search engines for the search terms that other people are currently using. Data online can be catalogued and summarized to speed up the process. Metadata reveals information about activity online, whether it's a text message, an online search, or clicking a link. It all moves information on the internet. This data can be collected to learn more about your activity online. Mo Hashem said he had no idea about it. Never really heard about it until you told me. Um, never heard of meta, never heard that term before. Maybe to feel safe if you have that option to turn that on when you want, when you want that option on, then okay. But if you, like, so there should be an off switch. Using unsecured Wi-Fi can put your information at risk. Google's collection of information on the web helps companies narrow their marketing efforts. Meta-analysis can pick up our keywords being used in a country, a county, a city, or a town. This helps Windsor Tech for, from AlphaCore in getting the most traffic to their customers. But the person who gets to the right keywords first will typically do better because they've been established in that topic for longer. Google also reports on whether or not web users are browsing via desktop or mobile device. This morning, Haley Trelout talks with Corporal Bruce Moncourt on the closing of the Veterans Affairs offices. 
Bruce is a veteran who was injured in combat during his tour in Afghanistan for Operation Medusa in 2006. He, along with other veterans, just returned from Ottawa to protest the closing of Veterans Affairs offices. Veterans use the, off the offices to help them with issues they have with transportation, rehabilitation, benefits, and homelessness. Here's five minutes with Haley Trelout and Bruce Moncourt. Welcome to this edition of Five Minutes With. This is Haley Trelout, and today our special guest is Corporal Bruce Moncur. Can you tell us what happened in Afghanistan in 2006? In 2006, I took part in Operation Medusa, where I suffered a pretty bad injury from an American A-10 warthog. Essentially, the bullets that hit me and my platoon are about the size of your forearm. So myself and 39 others were injured, and I was hit in the head, back, and butt, and had to undergo two brain surgeries. They removed 5% of the brain that was really beyond repair, and the uranium is still lodged in my brain. How long did it take you to recover from Operation Medusa? When I was injured, I lost the ability to read, write, walk, talk. I needed a walker, I needed a cane after a while. It was like a progression. Those essential things that I needed, like walking, talking, those came back within nine months. The military cleared me within three years, but I still have a lot of long-term effects, such as my, uh, f I fatigue very easily when I mentally exert myself or uh, my short-term memory. The Veterans Affairs offices, how did they help you? Myself and the Veterans Affairs offices have had some, sort of a love-hate relationship over these last uh, seven and a half years. A lot of the times I feel like I'm not being heard or my compensation, like for instance, the 5% of my brain received a 10% awarding or $22,000. So I felt I was grossly undercompensated for, you know, such a, a vital organ being injured and the long-term effects that I suffer now. On other t times, though, they do really help. Like, under their union, they were able to bring me to Ottawa to get my voice heard. And they, they do sit down. I have a case manager. Her name's Colleen, and she's like a part of my family now. It was when you can get through the bureaucratic red tape and you can get to the people that actually care in Veterans Affairs, that's when you really feel like uh, you're being looked after. When you heard of the plan to close the office, what was your reaction? Like I said earlier about how the love-hate relationship, I just felt it was another barrier that they were going to put up. I honestly felt like, okay, well, I've been fighting this system for seven and a half years. What's another hurdle to overcome? But then when I realized that it's, it's more than me, I'm a healthy 30-year-old man. It's when I see the World War II veterans, that we're losing a thousand World War II vets a month. And now more than ever is when they need the services. They're reaching the twilight years and those those are the men and women that need the services to stay open and need the help now. Going from Windsor to London is not a viable option for them. You went to Ottawa to directly protest the closing. What happened when you went there? When I was in Ottawa, it was like a circus almost. It was so surreal to be able to see how the government works and sometimes how the government doesn't work. First day we had meetings, we got our statements. There was 10 of us that were going to read a statement. So we each had one minute in our press conference to pretty much tell the world what we thought, why these branches needed to be open. So it was it was scary, you know, uh, you're going in there and you don't want to be like a fool, right? You don't want to go in there and put your foot in your mouth or have the wrong information. But it would have all been forgotten if it wasn't for Fantino walking out on the vets and barging in on us like that. I think it was a political blunder on his part and, a, you know, a, a good thing for us to be able to get our message across like we did. Do you feel like you've been heard since that incident? Have you seen any changes at all? The changes can't happen until the Conservative government decides that they're going to do the changes. The fact of the matter is, is they have a majority, and we need to look past all this uh, political mudslinging, and we need to look past all the he said, she said, and we need to look past all this rhetoric that's getting put out, and we need to focus on the task at hand, and that is getting the veterans the services they need, and in a timely manner. We have a system that is broken. We are behind our allies, in, in our treatment of veterans, and in fact, the matter is, it's embarrassing. Not as politicians, not as unions, as human beings. We need to really focus on how poorly these veterans are being treated. And like, I know I feel kind of sick to my stomach when I think of the monstrosity that this program has become. How did it feel being able to stand in front of everybody at the protest just last week? To give a speech like I did and to have people cheer and tell me that they're behind me 110%, it really feels good to know that all the sacrifice and all the headaches and all the time that I've put towards this is reaching people and I do have support out there. So, And all the veterans out there, I just want them to know that I'm going to try as, as hard as I can to get things done, but I'm only one person and there is a majority. So 
we definitely need maybe a change in parties or something that happened in 2015 that will send a message to any government that forms a new parliament that our voices will be heard. If I were to give any advice to anybody that wanted to join the military, I ask them to look at me, look at the veterans, how they're being treated. You need to explore all other options before you do sign the dotted line and do join Her Majesty's forces because they won't look after you. They won't protect you. They don't have your best interests at heart. And I ask that potential soldiers listen to that message and make their decision accordingly. This has been 5 Minutes with Bruce Moncur. Thank you for tuning in and thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Is the snow making you a little crazy? There is something special happening in Detroit. Clara Muska has your guide. Escape the cold winter this month and lose yourself in a world of art, film, and music. February is Black History Month and the Detroit Institute of Arts has special events all month. On Valentine's Day, hang out with the Motown Legends Choir, featuring legendary acts the Vandellas and the Contours. Are you a fan of abstract art? Explore the works of Romare Barden through his visual representations of American jazz, myth, and spirituality on Sunday, February 9th. If documentaries are your thing, check out a band called Death, a story about three brothers who started the first black punk rock band in Detroit. The screening is February 21st and 22nd. Want to hear some African folk tales? Join Mary J. Grant on February 23rd for a little storytelling. If you have cabin fever this month, the DIA might be worth the trip in the cold. For more information on these and other events, go to DIA.org. The Sochi Winter Olympics officially begin today with the men's and women's snowboard slope style qualifying runs. Whether you watch the whole event or tune in just for the start, the opening ceremony is definitely a crowd pleaser. Alice Hewitt has our update. Russia has spent an estimated $51 billion on the Sochi Olympics, which means their opening ceremony at the Fisher Olympic Stadium will be nothing if not large. So she is following the Olympic ceremony for the Summer Olympics in London, where director Danny Boyle showcased everything it was to be British, from Paul McCartney to the Queen. That event was put together at an estimated $50 million. For the time being, the organisers of the Sochi Olympics are not providing too many details on what the event will be like or even who will feature. Limited information on the ceremony is being released, but Russian newspaper Moscow Times is suggesting the ceremony will display aspects of Russian culture. There is also a bit of controversy involved in the Winter Games. President of Lithuania, Dalia Grysbogait, will not be in attendance at the ceremony. Grysbogait is boycotting the ceremony because of Russia's economic sanctions against Lithuania. But she's not the only one who won't attend. Although the US team will be the largest athletic delegation for Winter Games, President Obama will also not be in attendance because strained political relations. The ceremony will air on a number of networks starting at 7 p.m. tomorrow. That was Alice Hewitt giving us the information on the Sochi Olympic Games. This is Veronica Jerkowski and you've just enjoyed our first edition of Media Blender. Join us again next time.